welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I'm Catherine Hadro in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thanks for joining us. In this week's show, Puerto Rico prepares to march in support of a pro-life bill. A news report claims NPR pushed back on an advertisement for the Gosnell movie, We Speak Out, and this. Not only is it is it how God sees us and how God loves us. It's how we see the face of God in other people. A family opens up about how their daughter's short-lived life will have a long-lasting legacy. But first, pro-life groups are putting the pressure on the Department of Health and Human Services to stop funding research using aborted baby organs and tissue purchased from the abortion industry. The pro-life Susan B. Anthony list is calling on HHS Secretary Alex Azar to put an immediate moratorium on research experimentation on fetal tissue. The HHS department late Monday announced it canceled a nearly $16,000 contract with Advanced Bioscience Resources to reportedly fund efforts to implant human fetal tissue into mice to create a human-like immune system. But pro-life groups insist this cancellation is not enough because the National Institutes of Health funds fetal tissue experiments with nearly $100 million. HHS's cancellation with the fetal tissue firm follows a letter from 85 members of Congress calling on them to do so. Joining us now is Republican Congresswoman Vicki Hartzler of Missouri. She helped spearhead the congressional letter to the FDA objecting to the contract with the fetal tissue firm. Congresswoman, thank you for your time. You bet. First off, is the latest action from the Department of Health and Human Services enough, in your opinion? I think it's a very encouraging first step. I was very pleased that they have canceled the contract uh, with Advanced Biological uh, Resources. This company um, has been buying and selling baby body parts for a profit. Uh, when I was part of the investigative panel on infant lives, we found them uh, that they had been doing this, referred them to the Department of Justice for further in investigation, and it is just unethical uh, what they have been doing in violation, I believe, of federal law. So I was very pleased that they canceled that contract. Having said that, I now would like the uh, uh, Department of HHS to go further and to cancel all of the uh, contracts of other companies that are being funded through the National Institutes of Health Research. That adds up to about $95 million a year. Uh, I was encouraged that the Secretary said that they were going to be examining each and every one of these contracts and seeing if they comply with federal law and seeing what can be done, uh, that they were also going to explore alternative ways to perhaps uh, come up with tissue uh, that could be used in, in research that is ethical. Um, but um, I, I, I will feel better when all of them uh, are canceled. Congresswoman, as you mentioned, you did serve on the House Select Investigative Panel on Infant Lives in 2016. That panel did issue a criminal referral of advanced bioscience resources. Can you outline for us what did you learn about ABR then that concerned you? Sure. Well, they were buying uh, baby body parts from Planned Parenthood, paying $60 uh, per fetus, and then they were dividing up the baby by, and selling the individual parts for up to $325 per part. So they were selling the brain for $325, the lungs for $325, the eyeball for $325 to these research companies. It is just sickening, uh, and it just has to stop. That is disturbing. And even though this FDA contract is now canceled and you did call for that, why would the FDA issue this contract with a fetal tissue firm in the first place? Well, they would have to answer that. I suspect that they didn't know about this, uh, that this has been a pattern for a long time that this research has been going on. Uh, we just found out about it in the last couple of years as members of Congress to shine the light on it. Um, I think that probably was just somebody in uh, the bureaucracy that uh, just approved uh, the past research and didn't really examine it perhaps as closely as they should have. Uh, that is my hope, that it was just a mistake, that it was an oversight, but I am pleased that they have taken decisive action now to cancel that contract, and I hope that they will take decisive action to cancel similar contracts uh, that are using aborted baby part, body parts uh, 
through the National Institutes of Health Research. Absolutely, we'll keep our eye on that. Representative Vicki Hartzler of Missouri, thank you again for your time. You're welcome. For more reaction and analysis, we're joined by Marjorie Danenfelser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List. Marjorie, thanks for being here. Always glad to. You mm. called this latest action from the Department of HHS completely inadequate. Why? Well, it gives me some pain to say it to you, Catherine. I mean, I, these are, I, th I consider a pro-life family now. Mm. Um, we've been through meetings with Francis Collins, meeting with the secretary of HHS, Deputy Secretary, White House, all around. And it's not okay just to um, cut off a contract with one bad offender. The whole policy of using baby body parts as an, a method of experimentation, as a method of, of therapy, um, which is just proved as, a, as effective, mm -hmm. is just wrong and it has to end. So what we've been hoping for, asking for, lobbying for is a moratorium on, on all of that experimentation. And nothing could be more obvious to make, make yes, the point right than that David Delayden's videos exposing the, the, um, the thing. One thing okay, to that's say that's um, that, the, uh, that they should abide by the law. Hmm. Okay, they're, they're abiding by the law. Nobody's breaking the law, but the law is a bad law. Hmm. Um, and, and there is no requirement in the law that says that you must use baby body parts for in, in science. There just is none. So it has to stop. And to be clear, federal law does prohibit the buying and selling of mm -hmm. human fetal tissue for valuable consideration. Mm -hmm. But isn't that what's going on here? Uh, well, that's exactly the point. Um, that's exactly the point. It does bar it. Now, I was on the Hill when this, this whole policy was being formed. It was passed into law, but it was passed into law by um, with a lead of pro-abortion Democrats in the House of mm -hmm. Representatives who were very much for fetal tissue research. So basically they said, if you're going to do it, this is the way you're going to do it. Now that we have a pro-life, the most pro-life administration in history, we have a House, we have a Senate that is mm -hmm. entirely pro-life, there is no reason that we should feel in, under any obligation whatsoever to do this type of research. Marjorie, do the mothers of these aborted babies know that this research is going on? It's a good question because it is part of the law that was passed to sort of manage and regulate mm -hmm. all of this. And uh, no, very often they don't. Mm. Um, and we know that because some of the informed consent forms we can see, David Daleiden actually um, was able to, and other organizations, yeah. Abby Johnson has gotten a hold of some of those too. So we know that very often these women in very you know, vulnerable situations truly don't know what's going on and uh, and they should certainly know at a minimum what's happening. Well we will continue and I know <laughs> you will be continuing to watch oh, we will. what develops and what goes on here. Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you. Thank you. This week the Department of Health and Human Services announced it is canceling a contract with a fetal tissue firm to conduct research with aborted baby organs. While this cancellation is a good first step, it's just a drop in the bucket of all the taxpayer money spent on fetal tissue research. Any money that goes towards the trafficking of aborted baby parts is abhorrent, and no taxpayer dollars should go towards it. With that, here is this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and tell HHS Secretary Alex Azar to end all taxpayer-funded research using the body parts of aborted babies. The National Institutes of Health, which is a part of the HHS department, funds these grisly experiments to the tune of nearly $100 million. Federal law prohibits the buying and selling of human fetal tissue for valuable consideration, and we should expect a pro-life administration to end all such contracts. Let's send a clear and strong message that we do not support the taxpayer funding of research that is using the body parts of aborted babies. Again, you can send your message straight to the HHS department by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. We go now to pro-life headlines from around the globe. Ireland's health minister, Simon Harris, confirms abortions in Ireland will be free. This announcement comes after President Michael Higgins officially signed the new abortion referendum bill into law last week, repealing the nation's protection of the unborn. Harris says he expects the cabinet to pass the new rules for free abortions immediately. 
Britain's National Health Service is apologizing for a controversial advertisement. This NHS poster for emergency contraception asks women if they would swap their high heels and lipstick for a baby. Critics slammed the ad as sexist, with many mothers sharing online that they can still wear high heels after giving birth. And pro-life Puerto Ricans prepare to march in support of pro-life legislation. Senate Bill 950 would protect women and the preservation of life. Pro-lifers will march on Friday, starting at the capital of San Juan, to back the bill. For more on the pro-life efforts in Puerto Rico, Gina Penance joins us now from San Juan via Skype. She's the communications director of Fieles a la Verdad. We're also joined in our Washington, D.C. studio by Alfonso Aguiar, president of the Latino Partnership for Conservative Principles. Thank you both for being here. Gina, first off, tell us more about this pro-life Senate Bill 950 in Puerto Rico. Thank you, Catherine. First, here in Puerto Rico, there are no regula regulations on abortion. We are among the U.S. jurisdictions with the most permissive conditions regarding abortion. Here, it is legal to kill a baby up to the ninth months. Based only on a positive blood test, the Zika virus mothers are pressured by their doctors to abort. So Senate Bill 950 will protect both unborn babies and mothers because it prohibits abortions after 20 weeks when babies are capable of feeling pain. It prohibits sex selective abortions and abortions on the grounds of genetic abnormality such as Down syndrome. It also will protect babies who survive abortion. It also protects uh, women from being forced to ab to abort against their will because it protects a woman's right to free and informed consent and it also requires parental consent for a minor seeking an abortion. That is packed. That's a lot of information in there. Alfonso, can you tell us more about abortion laws in Puerto Rico and what exactly this bill would change? Well, just to, to echo what Gina said, uh, Puerto Rico is the only U.S. jurisdiction, and this is very important for, for viewers to understand, Puerto Rico is part of the United States. It's a territory. And abortion is legal in Puerto Rico because of Roe versus Wade. So Puerto Rico hasn't regulated or limited abortion. It's the only U.S. jurisdiction that has absolutely no regulation. Abortion in Puerto Rico is on demand, unrestricted. A 12-year-old can walk into an abortion clinic and have an abortion on the spot. That is really important information. And Gina, you're there in Puerto Rico. Do you think this bill is likely to pass? What kind of opposition are you facing? Well, for the first time, people in Puerto Rico are coming together in support of a historic pro-life bill that will save babies and mothers. The Senate committee has received thousands of signatures and phone calls in support of the bill. And we are going to march this Friday in support to the bill and ask our government tell our government that here in Puerto Rico, we will protect both lives, born babies and mothers. And well, the bill unfortunately is being opposed by a host of international pro-abortion uh, organizations from Latin American and the Caribbean and also Planned Parenthood, Amnesty International, Catholics for the Right to Shields, among others. You know, first of all, we have to put pressure on the legislature. Mm. and. Uh, Legislators in Puerto Rico are pro-life as well. Mm. Uh, even though Puerto Ricans are pro-life, in every poll that I've, I've seen, over 60, 70, or even 80 percent, depending on the mm. poll, uh, shows uh, 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 are, are pro-life in Puerto Rico. So, uh, but even though they're pro-life, a lot of people are, are not aware that abortion is not regulated right. in the island. And it's important for the U.S. pro-life movement. It's Absolutely. important for our viewers to be paying attention to this. Absolutely. Well, think about it. If this bill passes, uh, it could be challenged in federal court, so it could have an impact in other U.S. jurisdictions, mm -hmm. in other states. So it's very important that other pro-life uh, citizens across the country pray for the march, mm -hmm. pray that this bill passes, and actually join in spirit and in prayer the march. And speaking of the march, Gina, you will be speaking there. I know you're helping a lot with the behind the scenes. What are you going to tell marchers on Friday? Well, Catherine, Puerto Rico loves children. About 200,000 march against gender ideology, which is child abuse. 
At the pro-life march, I will stress the fact that abortion is the worst form of child abuse. Abortion tortures unborn babies to death. I would like our island to be known as the paradise where unborn babies and mothers are protected mm -hmm. and not as a desert where it is legal to kill babies up to the nine months. The pro-life pro -life cause joins together all Puerto Rico. So keep praying, keep calling and emailing our Senate to show support for this bill. This was such an important conversation to have, and I'm grateful for you both, Gina Penance of Fieles a la Verdad and Alfonso Aguiar of Latino Partnership for Conservative Principles. Thank you for being here. When we come back. She loved us by teaching us how to love her. We share how a 22-year-old woman who couldn't see, speak, or walk has left behind a legacy of love. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. The Gosnell movie is finally about to hit the big screen next month. But for this week's Speak Out, we look at yet another obstacle for the filmmakers in telling the story. The Daily Beast reported that the executive producer of Gosnell, the trial of America's biggest serial killer, sought to purchase an ad recently on the taxpayer-funded National Public Radio. The proposed ad described Kermit Gosnell as, quote, an abortion doctor. But NPR objected to that language, insisting Gosnell be described as just a doctor instead. It's been five years since he's been sentenced to life in prison, so here's a refresher on Kermit Gosnell's convictions. He was convicted of the first-degree murder of three infants born alive after botched abortions, the involuntary manslaughter of patient Karnamaya Mongar, and for performing abortions beyond Pennsylvania's 24-week limit, among a long list of other charges. The forthcoming Gosnell movie seeks to shed light on this case, but to this day, there are those who don't want this story told. By NPR refusing to refer to Gosnell as an abortion doctor, the outlet is contradicting the work of its own journalists who, take a look at this headline, have described Gosnell in that exact way, along with other mainstream media outlets ranging from the BBC to CNN. Words do matter. Calling Gosnell simply a doctor is sanitizing the reality of the crimes that took place inside his clinic. This isn't Catholic language. This isn't pro-life language. This is journalism. And this is truth. And we will continue to bring you this truth to you on EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. Remember, there is always an action you can take to counter today's culture of death in our world. Follow this week's call to action. Tell HHS Secretary Alex Azar to end all taxpayer-funded research using the body parts of aborted babies. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. It's been nearly four years since a Catholic Virginia family lost their precious 22-year-old daughter to a still unknown medical condition. It was a short life and filled with many challenges, but it was a life this family says will leave a long, lasting legacy of love. Here's this week's pro-life focus. Are you laughing? <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> when she passed away at the age of 22, she was five foot eight, um, beautiful young woman, but she was the developmental age of a seven month old child. The day Courtney Elizabeth Lenneberg began her life in the Catholic Church in 1992, she also began a life with a mystery diagnosis. Everything was fine until she was five weeks old. And on the day of her baptism, she actually had the first of very, uh, like, grand mal seizure. And she had multiple grand mal seizures for the, every day for the remainder of her life. Courtney's parents, Mary and Jerry Lenneberg, went straight to the emergency room as doctors considered possible causes from a brain tumor to meningitis. The tests continued, and at seven months old, the doctors thought Courtney might have what's called West syndrome. But their next move did more harm than healing. When she was seven months old, we gave her this medication, and what we didn't know is Courtney's allergic to steroids. And so within 36 hours, it, it's a steroid. She looked like the Michelin Man. Yeah, she Just blew up, her brain went septic, her brain swelled, she lost her sight, she lost all 
development that she had at that point, which was um, she was seven months. months old. So she was actually ahead of the game, even with the medication she was taking. So she was seven to nine months in development. And at that point, she never, ever superseded that. The search continued as Courtney's parents and older brother desperately sought to heal her. We spent the first seven years of her life really seeking answers, trying to fix her. That's what we kind of call it. We were trying to fix her. And um, we sought medical opinions from all over the United States and England, Scotland. Had all the tests done. All, every test available at that time. After seven years losing faith in medical interventions, the Catholic family looked for a miracle and traveled to the Lord's Grotto in France. Because of neurological issues, Courtney had little control of her hands and they were typically clenched in a fist. So it shocked her mother when Courtney suddenly grabbed a statue of Our Lady as she was being lowered into the cold Lord's water. As I'm looking at Courtney, she took Our Lady, put her over her heart, and with her fisted hand, placed the other hand there and did not move from that position. That never, that's the only time in her life that ever, ever happened. Then when it was Mary's turn to go into the miraculous spring waters, the prayer she had been practicing suddenly escaped her. They were asking me, what is the problem? The women were, you know, what could they pray for as they dunked me in the water? Um, and I stood there and I heard a young woman's voice and I thought it was one of the women. And the only word I heard her say was acceptance. And so I opened my eyes and um, I, I looked around and they asked me again and I was really confused and I said acceptance. Meanwhile, Jerry Lenneberg had a similar experience. So I went in the water at the same time, but she didn't know until we talked about it. I didn't know was. that, yeah. I said the exact same word and I'm like, acceptance, what does acceptance mean? I don't even know what that means. What does that mean? It took the Catholic couple four years to unpack what had happened. When waiting in yet another hospital room, Mary reflected on what she heard at a women's retreat about healing. The third point was um, acceptance, um, that healing would not happen this side of heaven. And it would only happen when you entered into the gates of heaven, into our Lord's arms. So here we were in a hospital watching this number on a board, seeing where she was in the neurosurgery process. And it just sort of landed on me acceptance. And I looked at him and I kind of knocked his coffee out of his hand. And uh, I said, we ha th this is it. This is what it is. And he said, I don't understand. I said, we heard a young woman's voice. Who went in the water first? And he just looked at me. Yeah, kind of like that. <laughs> mm. And I uh, said, Courtney went in the water first. I said, yeah. Mary and Jerry Lenneberg believe it was Courtney's voice they heard in Lourdes and their suffering servant of a daughter was sending a message. Everything changed. We brought her home and we lived boldly from that point on because we didn't know how much time we had. And so we took her everywhere. There was no place that she was not welcome, whether people wanted her there or not. The Catholic couple stopped trying to fix their daughter and finally accepted the life she had. You can use your hands, silly girl. The dignity of her personhood became paramount to us because she had a job to do, you know. Um, she had to evangelize. She had to evangelize. Her the Lennebergs started to evangelize too as Mary put pen to paper and shared Courtney's life on her blog, social media, and even in a forthcoming book. Are you having a good evening? Courtney's witness, her parents say, sends a countercultural message on love. She taught us how to love without condition. There was nothing she could do to earn our love. She wasn't going to be a prima ballerina. She wasn't going to be a scholar athlete. Um, she wasn't going to get married and have children. Um, we knew that. She just was Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> it was a love-filled life. And then, around Courtney's 22nd birthday, doctors told the family her time was coming to an end in this world. Her body was not processing food, and she was slowly starving to death. And I said, all right, Lord, I trust in you. If this is it, it 
it's been 22 years of a gift. As the Lennebergs brought their daughter home from the hospital for the last time, they decided the days before Courtney's death would be filled with life. So we brought her home and we began three months, the most beautiful, intense three months of our life with her. We opened our doors. Anyone that wanted to see her could come see her. There were strangers that I had met through the internet that showed up on my front lawn. May we come in and spend time with her. People continue to pour in with prayers, drawn to Courtney's model of holiness, right until the very end. On December 27, 2014, at 1.51 a.m. on the Feast of St. John the Beloved, she took her last breath. She simply exhaled in my arms uh, with a smile on her face. Then um, the hard part came because when you spent 22 years every day for 20 years, 22 years, 24 hours a day, physically caring for someone, and then they're simply gone, there's a huge void that's left. And nearly four years later, though they miss their daughter every day, the Lennebergs know that Courtney's mission is now theirs. That is her legacy of love, is that is, God does not make mistakes. She had every ability she needed to do the job he needed her to do. If she had everything she needed, and she has what the world thinks is so much less than what you or I might have, then what is our excuse? Thank you, Lenneberg family, for opening your home and your heart to us. That'll do it for this edition of EW Tam Pro Life Weekly, but I'd love to hear from you before next time. Email me at prolifeweekly at ewtn.com or like my public page on Facebook so we can keep this pro-life conversation going. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.